All right. So I want to start my talk with a couple of concrete examples which come from two different theories. And I'm going to try to convince you by the end of the talk that um, these two standard facts are um, reflections of the same homological um, kind of mi mysterious homological invariant. The first example is something you should know from complex analysis. Namely, um, take A1. This is, you, in fact, this works for any curve. Um, its compactification is P1. There's an infinite point at infinity. Um, and suppose that fi fix a polynomial, um, which is a function on A1, and assume that it has invertible discriminant so that its zero set is a disjoint set of points. Um, and then let's say that we're interested for some test function G of computing the sum over the zeros of F of the evaluations of G at these points. Um, well, then we have a formula for this from complex analysis. Namely, uh, we can take the form, differential form D log of F. Uh, this is a form that has residue one at all roots of F. Um, and now if we pair it with G, if we multiply it by G and take the total residue, that's going to give us exactly this evaluation that we want. And now we know from complex analysis that integrating that the sum of the residues of a, ra of a rational form is equal to negative the residue at infinity. So in terms of uh, um, at the cost of adding some sign, we get a formula as a residue at infinity of some special form. Okay, this is analysis. Second um, application is something that, that's related to analysis but to piatic analysis. Namely, suppose we have a piatic group G um, and say V is a irreducible cuspidal representation of this group. If this is something that you don't recognize, there is a statement like this that's even easier for compact groups or finite groups. Um, so we define a matrix coefficient of this group as follows. Take a vector in the representation, pick a covector in the dual, in, um, something called a contragradient dual, and assume that they satisfy some normalization. Then the matrix coefficient is a function on G, and it takes every element to the pairing between our form and our element shifted by G. So this is some non-trivial function. And in particular, this function in general will not be conjugation invariant. Now, on the other hand, um, given any representation, uh, any, say, cuspidal representation, um, we have a character functional. So this is um, some distribution on the group that is conjugation invariant. And there is a formula, I think originally due to, due to Arthur, which is that um, essentially the character is the, can, can be computed as, as the projection of the matrix coefficient to the space of conjugation invariant forms. So um, you need to be a little bit careful because the piatic group isn't compact and um, you need to, kind of wh when you're doing this projection, you need to average um, the matrix coefficient over all the conjugate orbits and this can be done in a, in a reasonable way using some standard harmonic analysis on a piatic group. So these are uh, apparently two very different statements. How are we gonna relate them? Well, the idea is that um, we're gonna assign two invariants. So remember, they, they were both kind of relationships between two different things we can assign to representation. So we want two invariants assigned to any representation. Um, which we're going to assume finite, a finite dimensional representation on algebra, though this applies to a more general language if you want to be fancy of some, some objects with some finiteness conditions on any category or even a DG category. Um, so what's uh, an invariant that we all know? Um, we'll say we have a finite dimensional representation um, rho. Then um, we have associated a character functional. So it's a functional from A to the base field. All our, all our algebras are gonna be over some fixed base field um, of arbitrary characteristics. Um, it's a functional from A to the base field which takes every element to the trace of the corresponding matrix. Is this just because we have no reference of 
this um, this is this 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 thing. Yes, this is this is no no the character is left hand side yes, and the and the um, yeah the other side is that right. So so the and and you can actually this is yeah here this is it, it is exactly the character as as we'll see. Um, right, so, so it takes an element of our algebra to the trace of the matrix. And now remember that the um, trace of the product of two matrices doesn't depend on the order you multiply them in. This means that if we take any commutator, then its trace is zero. So the trace function of factors through um, the quotient by the vector space spanned by commutators, which is called the cocenter. That's one invariant. Now there's a second invariant that comes from the, I think originally from the theory of Hoffer homology um, called the Dennis trace. And it's somehow dual. It lives in the cocenter. It's not a functional on it. And the way that's defined is a little bit more complicated. You wanna take some projective resolution of D and you wanna consider its projective. Um, but so the, the moral, the, the thing that I wanna convince you guys of today is that if we lived in an ideal world these two invariants should be related. And the relationship between them should be an integral formula like the ones I showed. So we don't live in an ideal world. Um, in all the cases we care about, um, somehow whenever the representation is small enough that the trace is defined, in, in almost all such, um, such cases, the, the Dennis trace is zero, or at least it loses a lot of information. So we wanna fix this situation. This is, um, fixable, and this is uh, fixable via a work in progress, which um, I'm working on and, and wanna explain, um, which is um, that when A is, is sufficiently nice algebra, so we want it to have large center, so to be finite over the center, and we, we want some additional nice homological properties, then you can upgrade this Dennis trace to an object called the De Dennis trace with compact supports. So what is this compact supports business? So there is a, a theory in algebraic geometry that is very beautiful and I think not at all sufficiently well known, um, which associates to an arbitrary variety of, uh, of finite types and, she and sheaf um, a complex of compactly supported sections. any sheaf, or any coherent, yeah, coherent sheaf, right? So, so of course, uh, if you have a constructible sheaf, then, then this is uh, more standard, but well, let's say F is a coherent sheaf, then I claim that there is a well-defined notion of sections with compact supports. And this is due originally to an idea of Delinean growth in Deke, and I think it was first written down in um, Delin's appendix to Hartshorn's residues and duality, but the idea is that well, wh what are compactly supported sections in analysis? We wanna take all sections and we wanna take the re restriction to some neighborhood of infinity um, and we wanna take the kernel. So the things that are zero in a neighborhood of infinity and then we wanna take this neighborhood of infinity, take the limit as this neighborhood of infinity gets smaller and smaller. Um, and this, of course you can't repeat this verbatim in, in, in algebraic geometry, but you can repeat it, you, you, can, you can make this have this make sense as long as you're willing to do some formal geometry. And because, because you, you're doing some formal geometry, your vector spaces become topological vector spaces. They're, they're pro objects. Um, but, but this is a nice invariant of a variety and a sheaf. Now on the, the, the second kind of ingredient of um, our, th that we're gonna need comes from homological algebra and it's something called Hochschild homology, which is an invariant associated to an algebra. Again, it's a graded vector space, or more carefully, it's a complex of vector spaces associated to an algebra, though you can make sense of it for any category, DG category, et cetera. And it makes sense to think of it as the derived analog of the cocenter. So in particular, the zeroth Hochschild homology is precisely this cocenter that I was talking about earlier. Now, there is a miraculous property of Hochschild homology, uh, which is that it's functorial in functors. So, so this is really kind of powerful. It says that for any functor from the category of representations of A to category of representations of B, which is maybe 
functor of abelian categories maybe has some nice homological properties that I'm not going to go into. Um, we can associate canonically a uh, map of graded vector spaces on Hausdorff homology. So this is Hausdorff homology associated to this arrow to F. And here there's an important ca caveat, which is that we can only do this. So, so F needs to be in some sense small. F needs to pr um, take finitely generated representations of A to finitely generated representations of B. Is the condition that you don't include the exception of homology? Yes. Um, well, so, so plus there are some homological conditions that, again, I'm going to skip over. Um, so, yeah, so, so we have this very powerful tool of, of getting a functor and producing a map. Um, so now, remember our, our setting originally is, is that we have an algebra A and we have a finite dimensional representation B. So associated to this, we have three um, special functors. The first one is a stupid functor. It's a structural functor from the category of vector spaces to the category of representations. And it's uniquely determined by sending the one dimensional vector space to um, B, to our fixed representation. Um, so the second functor that we're gonna care about is the Yoneda functor. Um, and it takes uh, a representation to HOM from this representation to B. This is a contravariant functor, but it turns out that Hochschild homology doesn't care if you replace a category by its opposite, so this is still okay for our picture. And the third functor is the um, mixed covariance HOM functor where we take a pair of representations um, and map them to their HOM. And it's easy to see that this in fact extends to a functor from the category of A tensor A op modulus. Um, and once again, in an ideal world, all three of these would give us maps on Hochschild homology. So let's look at these maps. So the first one has to be, it's the, the structure functor comes from vector spaces to Hochschild homology. So the corresponding um, map has to take um, the Hochschild homology of vector spaces, which is just K in characteristic zero, to the zero Hochschild homology of A. And this is precisely this Dennis trace that I was talking about in the beginning. Um, the second functor associated to the, the second map associated to your, your unit of functor has to go in the opposite direction. And this is easy to check that this is the, the character. And so as I, as I said in the beginning, the Dennis trace, when we care about finite dimensional representations, it loses a lot of information. And the character, somehow in the most cases we care about, it distinguishes a reducible representation, that's okay. And now what about our third kind of most mi mixed covariance HOM functor? Well, when, it's, um, when it does induce a map, uh, on Hochschild homology, this map is called the Mukai pairing. However, this is very rare. For, for derived categories, it happens more frequently, but for, for ordinary algebras, this can only happen if A is finite dimensional. Um, the reason is that if we take just the finite dimensional representations A and A, their HOM is A, is the vector space A, which is too big on this A is finite dimensional. So that's, that's a big problem. How are we gonna solve it? Well, I'm gonna introduce a couple of new constructions. So remember, I said that our algebra has large center. So in particular, this center has uh, a spectrum. It, it, right, so somehow in order to apply this, the, the Professor Deline's theory of compactly supported sections of coherent sheaves, we need some geometry. So this is, this is our geometric substrate. substrate. Um, spectrum of the center and it has a representation theoretic meaning as the space of blocks of irreducibles. Two irreducibles are in the same block roughly if they communicate with each other via Homs and X. But so we, we have this geometric guide that things sit over and in particular the Hochschild homology um, naturally becomes a module over the, the center, in other words, a sheaf over this algebraic variety. So when, when we think of it as a sheaf, we're gonna write it with curly letters. And in fact, it's, a, it's important now that this is a complex of sheaves, not just a graded sheaf. And if we have a complex of sheaves, we can take its hypercohomology, and we can also take its hypercohomology with compact support. 
And so this is going to be our definition of the compactly supported possible homology so space. Um, what do you mean by quasi -qu So what, is it clear that the center acts on it? No, I mean how big is it? Do you, you mean that it's coherent? Is it coherent? Um, yes, if, if, if our center is large, then it's, uh, yeah, on, on every hi it is coherent. And if we have this, uh, some additional smoothness condition, then, then yeah, so you expect it to be coherent. And that, that's actually exactly, right, so, so this is exactly what saves us, this, the fact that it's coherent over the center. Um, and so, so th this. So what is your definition of the center being large? Um, it has to be finite over the center. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, so now that we have this compactly supported Hochul homology, um, we can, we can start uh, improving our picture. So um, instead of the Dennis trace, we define a Dennis trace with compact support with values in the compactly supported HH0. The reason we can do this is because any finite, di di finite dimensional module has compact support over the center. Um, and then um, the other thing that we do is um, the, the Mukai pairing, we upgrade to this mixed Mukai pairing where on the one side we, we take the ordinary Hochul homology, on the other side we take Hochul homology with compact support. And the fact that this Mukai pairing is well defined is, is a reflection of the fact that that's you should be familiar to algebraists that if you take a projective module and an irreducible module then their HOM is finite dimensional. So um, now these tools, um, wait, let's, so what's the upshot? of our, our picture, so we, we end up with these two invariants, Hochul homology and compactly supported Hochul homology, and uh, pairing between them, this possibly degenerate. And now we have two special elements. The first one is actually a uh, functional on Hochul homology, which is the character. And the second one is this um, uh, element of compactly supported Hochul homology. So um, now, given such a picture, it's a very reasonable linear algebraic question to ask whether these two guys are conjugate. And the answer um, is not hard to prove that, that they are, if they're all well defined. So we, we have this formula that the, the character is actually given by pairing with this trace, G of this form. Yes. Yes. So, um, Okay, so, so now we have these two invariants, and let me just briefly say how, how these relate to the original two guys. So, so um, there's a lot of, so, so the compactly supported Hochul homology f in our ring of polynomials Kx is going to basically be the form, the, the G log form. The pairing is going to be this pairing that I was talking about, and the end result will be the, the integral formula I gave at the beginning. And in the um, piadic, um, picture, we ha so it turns out to be hard to compute H H zero, but there are some spectral sequence piece that you can compute that contains uh, matrix coefficients, and then the um, the Mukai pairing will precisely kind of um, take a uh, turn a matrix coefficient into the corresponding orbital integral object, and this this gives us Arthur's orbital integral formula, and I think. I'm not sure, but, but it seems that this is a new result in characteristic L. So originally it was known in characteristic H. So, so there are some questions that are interesting to try to apply this formalism to, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.